हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे श्री श्री राधा गोविंद देव की जय कलयुग धर्म श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जय वेलकम टू डे सिक्स of our Navratri festival with all of our festivities tonight is exciting tonight tomorrow okay in fact all the rest of the nights they all get very exciting from here on out we turn up all of the excitement we rev it up and we get deeper and deeper into the forms and pastimes of our most beloved goddess hopefully She's gotten dearer and dearer to us throughout all of these days. Tonight is a very heroic night, very very special. We are celebrating the goddess Katyayani and the color of the day is yellow. Tomorrow celebrates Kalratri. And tomorrow's color is green. So, we'll see what happens tomorrow. but for tonight we are going to be journeying through several realms we are going to go all over we are going to start in mathura we are going to journey to vindhyachala we are going to go back to vrindavan we're going to see what happens in the meantime but we're going to take a long journey we're going to do a lot We are going to pack it all in. We're going to hear about some very fierce activities of the goddess. Then we are going to hear about some very sweet activities. And we are going to hear about how we can pray and the right mood that we can place our hearts in so that we can pray and obtain the most beneficial favor favor of Katyayani Devi. So of course in order to bring our minds to the right atmosphere we are going to sing Jai Radha Madhava Jai Radha Madhava Kunja Bihari Kopi Janavalabha Girivara Thari Jai Radha Madhava कुंज बिहारी कोपि जन्नवाला भा गिरिवार धारी जशोदा नंदना ब्रज जान जान जाना चामुना तेरा वाना च 
ಚಾರಿ ಜಶೋದನಂದ ಪ್ರಜುಜನ ರಂಜನ ಚಾಮುನ ತೀರವನ ಚಾರಿ ಜೈ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕುಂಜ ಬಿಹಾರಿ ಕೋಪಿ ಜನ್ನವಲಭ ಗಿರಿವಾರಧಾರಿ ಜೈ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಜಯ ರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ರಾಧೆ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಜಯ ರಾಧೆ ಗೋವಿಂದ ಶಿಶಿರಾಧ ಮಾಧವ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶಿಶಿರಾಧ ಗೋವಿಂದ ದೇವ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀ ವೃಂದಾವನ ಧಾಮ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಶಿಲಾ ಪ್ರಭುಪಾದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ಅನಂತ ಕುದಿ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ವೃಂದ ಕಿ ಜಯ ವೈಷ್ಣವ ಸಂಘ ಕಿ ಜಯ so we are here we made it uh we got past the halfway point we've been going strong with these kathas and these sessions thank you for being here thank you for encouraging me thank you for reaching out during the day however you choose to reach out if you write me a message if you leave a little comment thank you they are all very much appreciated your encouragement your enthusiasm your really well your beautiful prayers and well wishes are so appreciated thank you you all are the reason that i do this and the reason that i can try and somehow continue to please these supreme divine personalities by narrating coming on and sharing these pastimes so we are going to speak our magical incantation before we get into we dive right into all of the nectar om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya so are we ready are we really ready to dive into the kata of Katyayani Devi who happens to be a very big favorite not just of my own of many 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 people she is worshiped in north india and in south india east west all over she is worshiped it also is signifying the beginning of the days of durga puja It is at this time where they paint the beautiful Murti's eyes and they install her within the divine Murti to be worshiped on the upcoming Ashtami day. So it is the beginning of Durga Puja. So I'm wishing you all a happy Durga Puja. And one might think, you know, there's there's so much and we've been talking for days and days and days why. why we worship her why we are giving all homage and all honor and prayer unto her but we'll begin with one small verse from mahishasur mardini stotram ai giri nandini nandita me dini vishva vinodini nandinu te ಗಿರಿವರವಿಂದ್ಯ ಶಿರೋದಿನಿ ವಾಸಿನಿ ವಿಷ್ಣು ವಿಲಾಸಿನಿ ಜಿಷ್ಣು ತೇ ಭಗವತಿ ಹೇ ಶಿತಿ ಕಂದ ಕುದುಂಬಿನಿ ಬೂರಿ ಕುದುಂಬಿನಿ ಬೂರಿ ಕೃತೆ ಜಯ ಜಯ ಹೇ 
ಮಹೇಶಿನಿ ರಮ್ಯ ಕಪಾರ್ದಿನಿ ಶೈಲಸುತೆ ಜಯ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಮಹೇಶಸುರ ಮರ್ದಿನಿ ರಮ್ಯ ಕಪಾರ್ದಿನಿ ಶೈಲಸುತೆ ಜಯ ಜಯ ಹೇ ಮಹೇಶಸುರ ಮರ್ದಿನಿ ರಮ್ಯ ಕಪಾರ್ದಿನಿ ಶೈಲಸುತೆ this verse says o divine mother all obeisances unto you i take refuge at your lotus feet o divine mother i invoke you who is the daughter of the mountain king by whose presence the entire world is filled with joy for whom the whole world is a divine lila O oh, you who is praised by Nandi, O oh, divine goddess, I invoke you. You dwell on the summit of the Vindhya hills, the best of the mountains. You give joy to Lord Vishnu as his sister, and you are praised by Lord Indra. O oh, goddess Bhagavati, you are the consort of he who has a blue throat. You have many many relations in this world being the cosmic mother and you have created abundance victory to you victory to you I take refuge at your lotus feet O destroyer of the demon Mahishasur victory to you who shine with beautiful locks of hair you are the daughter of the mountain king Shaila Sute So this is Katyayani Devi. And I'd like to begin as all wonderful stories begin. It was a dark and stormy night. Really, it was a dark and stormy night. And it was an Ashtami night. in the city of mathura everything was completely dark everything was covered in shadow everyone in mathura was asleep in fact everyone for miles was asleep so deeply asleep that they had no idea what was happening a few people were awake two or three and in this very dark stormy night vasudev and devaki are in the prison of kamsa and they see the beautiful form of lord vishnu And Shrimad Bhagavatam says that this form appeared first with four arms, helmet, bejeweled necklaces, and weapons. He appeared with his mace, lotus flower, conch shell, and chakra. And he was a baby. Even with four arms, this four-armed form of Lord Vishnu was a baby. and it is at that moment that in the village of vrindavan a daughter is born a son had already been born to yashoda and as she was overcome with labor pains this son was born a child she was unaware of the gender of the child that had been born and when lord vishnu appears in the prison with Vasudev and Devaki a daughter is also born to Yashoda and then Yashoda falls into a deep sleep now being relieved of the greatest labor pains Lord Vishnu tells Vasudev and Devaki O oh Vasudev don't be afraid take me across the river across the Jamuna into the village of Vrindavan and replace me 
with the daughter that has been born to Yashoda. So, Vasudev takes a treacherous path across the Jamuna, which is said to be filled with raging waves and wild beasts. But, miraculously, that Jamuna River creates a pathway for Vasudev, who is being sheltered on this dark and stormy night by none other than Ananta Shesh, who acts as a, sub a supreme umbrella for the Lord of the Universe that Vasudev holds on a basket above his head. He reaches this beautiful village, nestled in quiet, where everyone is asleep, mystically, Vasudev was imprisoned with shackles on his arms and suddenly those had fallen off. The guards outside the prison cell had fallen asleep by the mystical potency of Lord Vishnu, who is none other than this little baby girl who is now laying next to her twin brother on the bed of Yashoda. Vasudev goes and carefully exchanges the baby. It is said that this baby, this Vasudev Krishna that comes with Vasudev, merges into the body of Yashodarani's son, Govinda. And he's so wonderful that somehow Vasudev doesn't even see that there is another baby there. So, he picks up the baby girl and carries her with a heavy heart back to Mathura. Once in Mathura, he enters back into the prison cell, closes the door, replaces the shackles, and hands this effulgent baby to his wife. Devaki looks at this gorgeous, beautiful child and clutches her to her chest as though she were her own. This beautiful baby begins to cry. Who can describe the cry of the great goddess? At hearing this cry, the guards startle awake and they go and inform Kamsa. Kamsa comes rushing to the prison cell. He sees Devaki and says, give me the child. Devaki begins to plead for the child's life. Kamsa, this child will be the wife of your son. Just let her live. The, the prophecy says you will be killed by a male child, not a female child. This child can cause no harm to you. Let me keep her. This child means nothing to you, but means everything to me. Just let me keep this one child. It is described that Kamsa gets down on his knees and wrestles this baby away from his sister. He holds this baby within his arms and says, nothing can stop me and is prepared to dash her upon the stone ground of the prison cell. As he throws the child, she rises up into the air and she assumes a gigantic form with many arms riding in a thousand petaled lotus chariot drawn by horses. And she looks at Kamsa and says, You fool! What good do you think killing me will do? The person who is destined to kill you has already been born somewhere else in this world. You cruel, cruel fool. You cannot escape death. You torture your poor sister in vain. You commit so many atrocities by killing so many babies in vain. It is said that as she rises up into the sky, indeed, she kicks Kamsa in the head with her foot as she takes this wondrous form with many arms riding in this chariot. And then, this goddess goes to reside in the Vindhya hills and is known as Vindhyachala Vasini. This same goddess who resides in the Vindhya hills is none other than Katyayani Devi. This is the goddess 
that Kamsa sees, who foretells his doom and his end. But she has another origin story. We hear about this story from the Vamana Purana and the Varaha Purana. And so we are able to weave together these stories in a narrative. The devas were broken and battered. With Lord Brahma as their leader, they made their way to the celestial abode of Lord Vishnu. Each step felt as though they were climbing endless mountains as they dragged the weight of their grief behind them. Seeing Lord Vishnu seated with Lord Shiva, the gods, unable to hold in their feelings any longer, all began to explain at once. They had been harassed by a vicious demon named Mahishasur, part buffalo, part demon, and pure evil. Mahishasur had driven them from their homes. He had taken over their universal positions. He was usurping the powers of the universe and creating chaos wherever he went. It seemed as though the demon would not be pleased until he had taken over the entire creation and brought it under his control. Indra spoke for the gods, his voice cracking and quivering with the strain this demon had put on them all. My lords, please, you must save us. If you cannot save us, then we will certainly forfeit our lives this very day. There is no possible way we can withstand the tyranny of this horrible demon a moment longer. Indra's eyes slipped closed, hoping against hope that, as always, the saviors of the universe would be able to help them again. The three murtis, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, looked at one another. Lord Brahma could see the anger building within the eyes of Lord Vishnu and Lord Shiva, listening to the outrageous treatment that the devas were forced to endure at the hands of Mahishasur. Lord Brahma felt his own anger catch flame deep within his heart. This type of injustice could not be allowed to continue. No one should have had to tolerate such atrocities. The heads of creation sighed in angry unison, their rage gurgling up within them until it was released in a hot-tempered exhale. That sigh took the form of a glowing fire that began to morph and shape. The devas gasped, wondering what this new energy was. The fire was so bright that many of the devas had to shield their eyes and the sensation of the heat on their skin made them take a cautious step back. With a sound like the beginning crack of thunder, the gods watched as the mystical fire took the shape of a woman before it disappeared. The sage Katyayana sat in deep meditation, praying to the goddess Adi Shakti. He begged her within his mind to allow him to serve her. He prayed to her as though she were his own daughter. He saw her beautiful feet, reddish like the delicate petals of a lotus, her many hands, one of which was held up in blessing of fearlessness, and her serene face, effulgent like the full moon and illuminating every dark corner within his heart. It was as he was pulled deeper and deeper into this meditation on the Supreme Goddess that he felt the atmosphere around him begin to crackle with energy, almost as though he could feel the moment just before lightning struck. His eyes flew open, and he glanced around him surprised. He felt the undeniable presence of the Goddess, but he wouldn't believe it until he saw with his own eyes. Before him was the great Goddess herself. She had many arms which seemed to stretch in all directions. Her form was as fierce as it was beautiful. Her color like a dark jewel, effulgently lit from everywhere and nowhere at once. Her face was just as beautiful to behold as the sage thought it would be in his meditation. With his arms flung wide open in adoration, he gazed openly upon the goddess who looked back at him with eyes dark as midnight, eyes that held the entirety of the universe within them. 
He opened his mouth to pray to her, but he could not utter anything. He could only whisper, Katyayani Devi. Because she appeared in his ashram, he had named her as his own daughter, with a gentle smile and a graceful incline of her head. She accepted the name that he had so lovingly gifted to her. Who could claim to be the father of this primordial goddess? Katyayana Muni knew he could not possess her. His only desire was to serve her. And she had benevolently accepted his service, awarding him the greatest position. The devas converged on the ashram of the sage, understanding that the goddess had chosen that place to make her appearance. The devas gave Katyayani Devi all of their choicest and most wonderful and powerful weapons. Brahma gave her a water pot, the Himalayas gave her a lion, Lord Vishnu gave her his very own chakra, and Lord Shiva came forward and gave the goddess his trident and a sword. While the gods praised her, the goddess looked over them all with a glance that held all of the heat of fire and the mystery of love and devotion. She mounted her lion and immediately set out for the Vindhya mountains, where she made her home. Word spread quickly about the wonderful goddess who had made her home in the mountains. It wasn't long before news of her beauty reached Mahishasur, who thought that this strong and powerful woman seemed to be made for him. He sent an emissary to Katyayani Devi, asking for her hand in marriage, and received her swift reply. You may surely be a great hero, but only the one who can defeat me in battle will become my husband. Mahishasur was intrigued by the fire he saw within her, and he set out immediately to win his supposed bride. All of the gods stood as witness when the Devi and the Asura met on the battlefield. This was the day that they had eagerly been awaiting. Finally, there would be someone to end their suffering. Mahishasur sent armies of demon soldiers, but Katyayani Devi destroyed them all as though they were mere dolls. Mahishasur sent his best commanders, but she made short work of them as well. Soon the battlefield was littered with the bodies of the fallen followers of Mahishasur. Finally, the time came for him to fight her himself. Katyayani Devi unleashed weapon after weapon upon the demon, but they were all ineffective against the seemingly unconquerable Asura. Finally, filling with anger, she jumped from the back of her lion carrier and onto the shoulders of the demon. Stepping onto his shoulders, she pounded him again and again with her feet. Try as he might, the demon could not free himself from her grasp, and finally he was weakened by the intense pounding of the goddess's feet. It is said that Mahishasur took form after form as a lion, as a buffalo, as an asura, so many forms in order to try and get away from the grasp of the goddess. But try as he might. He could not escape. Finally, seeing her opportunity, with a loud cry that echoed in all directions and sounded like mountains shattering, she plunged her trident through the demon and with her sword severed his head with one swift blow. Although she had beheaded the demon from his body, suddenly emerged another fearful personality, brandishing a sword ready to continue the battle. Katyayani Devi kicked that new demon in the chest, grabbed him by the hair, and once again severed his head. One of my friends, who is a great worshipper of Devi, when she tells this story, you can feel the love and devotion rising off of her in waves. And what she says is, as they are fighting, Maisha Sur looks up into the face of the goddess. And in great victory, she smirks at him. And that smile disarms Maisha Sur. And it is in that moment that she destroys him with nothing more than the smile on her fierce, effulgent face. 
That is the moment where he is completely disarmed and he knows his defeat is certain. The demons began to wail with grief and flee for their lives while the devas gathered around the battle-decorated goddess. They began to offer her sweet prayers of gratitude and appreciation and they sung of her glories as they rejoiced at the death of the demon who had caused them such heartache. Victory, victory to you, precious daughter of the mountains, wielding a trident and sword and striking fear into the hearts of the demons with your melodious voice. You offer protection to the three worlds. Victory to you, O Mahisha Sur Mardini. That is Katyayani Devi. So, how do we get back to Vrindavan from here? She is a wonderful goddess, and she is filled with ferocity and fierce power. She goes and makes her home back in the Vindhya mountains, in Vindhyachala. But, within Vrindavan, the gopis undertake a vow during the coldest months of the year, the hay month season, they take a vow to worship her, to get Lord Krishna as their husband. They all have their sights set on him. They have all been charmed by the hero of Braj. They have all been wonderfully held captive. Their hearts are held firmly in his grasp. And they can think of nothing else. All they know is they want to belong to this great hero, Govinda, the one who brings joy to the hearts of everyone in Vrindavan. And so they decide to undertake the vow of Katyayani Vrat, a month-long vow of austerity, to gain Krishna as their husband, as the lord of their life. So within the wonderful celebrated work Ananda Vrindavan Champu, we hear of how the gopis pray, Duma Katyayani Devi. So earlier, they were being discouraged by their mothers from performing this Katyayani Vrat. Their mothers said, how will you perform this Vrat? You're like tender flowers. This Vrat you eat once a day, just unspiced kitchri. You take cold, cold baths early in the morning. How will you be able to perform this Vrat? Who among you will even be able to chant proper mantras to please the goddess? Don't do it. And... They think, maybe our mothers have some truth to what they say. Being discouraged by their mother's words from performing the Katyayani Vrat, the gopis felt temporarily despondent. Nevertheless, when the first day of the hay month season arrived, waves of blissful raga agitated the ocean of their hearts. With great enthusiasm, they collected Havishyana, and the other articles to execute the Katyayani Vrat. The bodies of the gopis revealed a distinct type of beauty while undergoing the hardship of the Vrat. Since they no longer chewed tambula, the natural luster of their lips glowed prominently. Though their skin turned somewhat pale and hardened without their daily oil massages, their bodies glistened like fresh ashok leaves washed by the rain. Since they no longer applied oil to their hair, it became dull and dry, like the minds of the destitute. From eating once a day, their bodies became very thin and lost their natural effulgences. Though they still wore gems and jeweled necklaces, their bodies looked as lackluster as the second phase of the dark moon. However, seeing the intensity of their penance, and their emaciated condition, all the Brijbasis were astonished and felt pity for them. 
the burning desire to attain Krishna within the minds of the gopis interrupted their sleep and forced them to wake up in the middle of the night. Although insufficient sleep reddened their eyes, they washed their faces, discarded their white sleeping dresses, and put on auspicious clothes. So, even though they were discouraged by their mothers from performing this austere vrat, they just couldn't rid their minds of Krishna. And so they were pulled by the intense ocean of romantic feelings within their heart to please just have Krishna as their Lord. While throwing off the lethargy of sleep, they joyfully considered, following the scriptural injunctions, let us take an early morning bath in the Jamuna. Every morning the gopis would meet according to the secret arrangements they had made the night before. Welcoming each other with respectful words, they embraced and exchanged great love. With their impeccable qualities and graceful lotus stem-like arms, the gopis looked like an attractive cluster of lotuses walking down the path. Alone, they felt shy and hesitant to approach Krishna, but as a group, they shone with the pride and power of a dazzling cascade of light. So, sometimes they would feel shy, thinking, we're gonna... If I were alone, I wouldn't pray to be so bold as to approach Krishna and ask for him as my husband from the goddess. But now with a group of my friends, I am able to journey to the great goddess. Spreading their radiant effulgences in all directions, the gopis appeared like a garland of lightning bolts moving on the earth. Every day before sunrise, these lovely young ladies went to the Jamuna while singing loudly about the qualities of Hari, who is forever praised by heavenly demigods like Brahma. Full of rhythm and precise intonations, their voices blended harmoniously with the soft, sweet notes of their venas. A sweet smell emanated from their mouths as the gopis engaged in kirtan. Captivated by that fragrance, Swarms of bees flew excitedly towards their lotus faces, hoping to drink that nectar. When the gopis blinked their eyes in fear of the buzzing bees, the beauty of their faces greatly increased. The chiming sounds of their bangles conquered the chirping of the love-maddened sparrows. Just as the hot sunshine does not wilt the lotus flowers, the faces of the gopis remained fresh and attractive, even though they constantly burned with the desire to meet Krishna. The maidservants of the gopis followed behind them, carrying the finest ingredients for Devi Puja, which they had collected according to strict rules. Thus the Brajkumaris, brimming with affection, ignored the restrictions imposed by their elders and proceeded to the bank of the Jamuna. Although Jamuna Devi is the daughter of the sun who removes all darkness and afflictions, she herself is filled with streams of darkness. With the eyes of her swirling waves, Jamuna Devi could directly perceive the faith of the young women who desired Nanda Sutta as their husband. Seeing the agitation caused by their blossoming prema, Jamuna Devi wanted to embrace the gopis with the playful hands of her waves. O oh, Sakis, come, come, she beckoned to them. Understanding the desire of the young girls, Jamuna Devi offered her respects and tenderly looked at the gopis from the corners of her lotus flower eyes. So everything is personified within Vrindavan, even the river Jamuna, with her wave-like arms and her lotus flower eyes. The rays of the rising sun instigated pleasure pastimes among the pairs of reunited Chakravaka birds who had been separated the night before. Water birds chirped gaily while flying overhead. Upon arriving at the Jamuna, the impatient Brajkumaris immediately threw off their woolen shawls, covered by thin, white, cotton bathing outfits. Their blissful bodies of the gopis looked more beautiful than a stream of falling snow. The gopis shivered and softly sighed and gasped due to the chilly morning air. 
The quivering of their leaf-bud-like lips revealed the splendor of their pearly white teeth. The gopis smiled gently and giggled upon noticing their friends feeling the same way. Reacting to the biting cold, the gopis made a comic scene by slapping their arms and crossing their legs in various contorted postures. Commencing their rut, the Brajakumaris offered obeisances to Kalindi before bathing. Climbing down the bank, they slowly entered the water. Ignoring the cold, they followed all the prescribed rules and completed their baths. Then they joyfully ran back up to the banks of the Jamuna. After coming out of the water, the gopis felt elated over courageously tolerating the painfully cold water. The water dripping from the garments on the limbs of the young, beautiful, doe-eyed gopis with pretty smiles fell onto the earth. It seemed that their bodies wept golden tears after being tortured by the cold, blackish waters of the Jamuna. The water birds that had spent their youth among the blooming lotus flowers in the Jamuna saw these drops as the wonderful essence of nectarian beauty. The shimmering light emanating from their golden bodies made the gopis look like blissful embodiments of the goddess of fortune. The water previously caught in their hair now poured out rapidly. It appeared as if, as if the gopis' hair cried out of fear. As they gracefully dried themselves with small towels, the gopis looked very beautiful. After removing the water from their bodies, the gopis compassionately gave up their enmity toward the cold water. While drying and arranging their hair, it seemed that the gopis were showing affection to their weeping hair. The desirable Brajakumaris had achieved a unique position due to their sweet beauty and refulgent golden complexions. In Srimad Bhagavatam, it is said that these gopis, desiring the nectar of Sri Krishna's lips and those that would receive the nectar from Sri Krishna, would then become expert in art in music, in decoration, in recitations, in poetry, and in dressing. So the gopis, even when undertaking an austere rut, they would decorate themselves very sweetly because they understood that it would please Krishna. And when he saw them, he would think, those are my gopis, those are my kumaris. So we can remember this when we are thinking about what we wear, how we dress up, how we decorate ourselves. We can decorate ourselves longing to be enjoyed by the glance of Govinda. Longing that he just glances our way just once. And in that way, making all of our decoration, all of our ornamentation perfect and with perfect purpose. So we can follow in the footsteps of these gopis and make sure that we ornament ourselves and look incredibly beautiful no matter what rut we have undertaken, no matter what the austerity is. We can consider it our duty to make ourselves ornamented very nicely for the pleasure of Govinda, thinking, I am Govinda's property. And if Govinda sees me, then somehow he will be enjoyed. He will be so happy it's just seeing me. Somehow, if I can bring pleasure to the heart of Govinda with my, with my decoration, then I've perfected my existence. After bathing and drying their creeper-like bodies, the gopis looked even more beautiful as they filled their lotus mouths with the sweet name of Krishna. Even Lakshmi Devi could not surpass their fortune. While dressing in fresh clothes, they thoroughly immersed their minds in remembrance of Krishna. The borders of their dresses were ornamented with attractive lacing of gold and silver threads. After tying up their hair, the gopis, who are, very, who are expert in various arts, proceeded to a special place on the bank of the Jamuna. 
They occasionally still gasped and sighed from the cold while carrying the puja paraphernalia that they had painstakingly gathered. The sweet fragrance of their breath again attracted swarms of bees, but the gopis felt nervous and twitched their eyebrows because they could not tolerate the cold wind generated by even the wings of those bees. Finally feeling compassionate, Suryadev gradually dispelled their chill by caressing them with his gentle, warm rays. Thus Suryadev showed more affection to the gopis than to his own daughter, Jamuna Devi. The gopis set the excellent puja items on the sandy white banks of the Jamuna, which glistened like camphor powder. They chose a clean, quiet place for puja. It was a secluded location, undisturbed by the wind and free from the contamination of Jamuna foam and the footprints of birds and animals. Desiring to make a murti of the goddess Katyayani out of sand, the highly qualified gopis spoke in sweet voices, resembling the soft cooing of cuckoos. One gopi said, O oh my friends, we have never observed the Katyayani vrat. Before initiating this auspicious act, we should remove the evil elements from the atmosphere. Are we going to conduct the worship individually or altogether? Let us decide in such a way that we do not end up with a disaster. With faith and intelligence, we should take a decision. Another Saki said, We should do the puja all together in a group. To perform puja separately is not good, but worshipping all together will be more beneficial. The experts in puja chanted sweet verses, praising Krishna's attributes while offering handfuls of fragrant flowers to a murti of Katyayani, molded from sand. Seeing the elegant murti, the gopis felt that Bhagavati Katyayani herself had appeared in that murti. The gopis thought, How fortunate we are to perceive Goddess Bhagavati, even though we have not yet even installed the deity. Feeling that they had satisfied Devi Katyayani, the gopis felt elated. This strengthened their determination to execute the vow. To properly please Katyayani, the gopis did Manasi Puja of the Murti before commencing the worship. While concealing the confidential desires within their hearts and controlling their minds, the gopis silently fetched water from the Jamuna. The gopis kept Krishna locked inside their hearts like a precious treasure. After washing their hands and doing achaman, they sat down on kusha asanas. Fixing their minds in the mode of goodness, the gopis silently worshipped Katyayani. To invoke Katyayani's presence in the murti, the expert pujaris respectfully uttered the mantra, Iha gacha gacha devi sannidanam ihachara Krishna sa sanidanam naha prapayasva namo nama. Come, Devi, please enter this murti. Please help us come close to Krishna. We pay obeisances to you again and again. On this day, what a beautiful mantra to utter and remember. Come, Devi. Please enter this murti. Please help us come close to Krishna. We pay obeisances to you again and again. After invoking Katyayani Devi in this way, the young gopis carefully placed an asana before her. With great bliss, they humbly requested the glorious Katyayani. Welcome, Devi. We offer our heartfelt respects to you. Please accept this splendid asana. O oh, Devi, may your visit be auspicious. We secretly request you to be merciful to us and bring Krishna before us. While bathing Katyayani Devi's feet in water mixed with the appropriate ingredients, the gopis said, O oh, completely pure Durga, please accept this worship of your feet. May our hearts be cooled by this foot water, which reminds us of Krishna's perspiration. Please help us meet our beloved Krishna. Following the foot wash, the Braj Kumaris offered priceless argya, 
auspicious hand wash made of selected items gathered according to Shastric rules. O Devi, you are worshipable by all the demigods. We offer this argya in hopes that you will soon award us the association of Krishna, who is our maha argya, our most worshipable. After argya, the gopis presented achaman, mouthwash. O Devi, we offer this pleasant achaman to you in hopes that we will be able to taste Krishna. Then they offered Madhuparka, a pleasant drink composed of honey, ghee, and yogurt, saying, O Devi, we offer you this sweet Madhuparka with the desire to taste Krishna's honey-sweet lips. Absorbed in samadhi and overcome with prema ras, those young, pure-hearted girls with thin waists offered Achaman again while saying, We offer you this Achaman with the desire to repeatedly somehow get the nectar from Krishna's lotus mouth. They brought aromatic oil in a jeweled container for massaging the body. Even without any wind, it automatically dispersed its rich fragrance throughout the air. It was an attractive, deep red oil, just suitable for massage. The gopis said, O oh Devi, please accept this oil for massaging your body. Please attach our bodies, which are saturated with prema, love, to each one of Krishna's limbs. To remove the oil, they use a soft, scented powder, which seemed like a spray from a, a, a fountain of concentrated bliss. While doing this, the gopis said, We offer this fragrant powder to you. Please remove our sorrow by giving us the association of Krishna. They respectfully offered bathing water scented with the finest camphor and kept in a golden vessel. We offer you this finely scented bath water. Please arrange for us to bathe in the nectar of Krishna's association. The Braj Kumaris very methodically offered a neatly folded sari woven with golden yellow threads. O oh Devi, please accept this golden sari. Please arrange that our clothes can be exchanged with Krishna's clothes. So if we notice in the marriage ceremony, as they tie the knot between the bride and the groom, it seems as though their clothes are exchanged. Sometimes the sash that is worn on the side of the groom is now placed on the bride's right arm. So it seems as though their clothes are exchanged. They brought the best quality, flawless jewels and ornaments made by expert goldsmiths. Please decorate yourself, O Devi, with these priceless ornaments. And please adorn us with the nectar of Krishna's limbs. The young lotus-eyed gopis brought attractive ointments made of aguru, camphor, and musk. O Devi, we offer you these opulent ointments. Please arrange that our bodies will become anointed with the touch of Krishna's limbs. The air attained good fortune by carrying the pleasing celestial aromas of the various scents presented by the gopis. O oh, Devi, we offer you these scents which enliven the nostrils. Please make our limbs fragrant with the very aroma from Krishna's body. They offered Vrindavan flowers from all six seasons, which were very colorful, covered with sweet pollen, and surrounded by bees. They offered incense made from black agru, kush root, and clusters of the finest gugul, saying, O oh Devi, we offer you this pleasing incense smoke. Please show us your effulgence and pacify our burning hearts." While offering opulent ghee lamps mixed with camphor, the gopis prayed, Please illuminate the house of our hearts with the lamp of Krishna's own kastuba jewel. They offered milk, butter, 
rock candy, bananas, coconuts, mung dal, sun-dried rice, cakes soaked in sugar, water, malpua, sweet rice, cooked grains, amrita keli, and assorted little tasty cakes covered with powdered rock candy icing. Sprinkles. Powdered rock candy icing is sprinkles. How wonderful is Vrindavan Dham? <laughs> While presenting these delicacies to Katyayani, the girls prayed, Please eat all these pure and pleasing food offerings, and please give us the remnants from the lotus mouth of the ever youthful Krishna. Fixing their minds on their goal, the gopis chanted the following mantra with full, full feeling. Katyayani Mahamaye Mahayoginyadishwari Nanda Gopasutam Devi Patin me kurute namaha Katyayani Mahamaye Mahayogin Yadishwari Nanda Gopasutam Devi Patin me kurute namaha Katyayani Mahamaye Mahayogin Yadishwari Nanda Gopasutam Devi Patin me O Goddess, Katyayani, O Great Potency of the Lord, O Yogini, O Possessor of Great Mystic Power and Mighty Controller of All, please make the son of Nanda Maharaj our husband, make him our Lord, we offer our obeisances unto you. Then they muttered japa with clear pronunciation. While offering tambula and achaman, the gopis said, Please relish this tambula made of betel, cloves, camphor, and cardamom. And please color our lips with the juice of Krishna's own tambula. Performing arti, they said, O Maheshwari, we show these lamps to you in hopes that you will please illumine our limbs with the glow of Krishna's own effulgent limbs. After arti, they gracefully bowed down on the ground and offered eloquent prayers, disclosing their mind's desires. The gopis prayed, O Mother of Ganesh, Neither your husband Mahadev, nor Brahma, nor Brihaspati can offer suitable praise to you. What to speak of others? We are greedy only to taste Krishna. Therefore we glorify you so that you will stop the itching of our tongues. O Maheshwari, please shower your mercy upon us. You are called Yoga Maya, the potency of Mahavishnu who possesses all energies. You have the power to do the impossible. You are peace, tolerance, nourishment, satisfaction, knowledge, and even ignorance. Although you bind the living entities, you are the giver of liberation. O mother of all, by your glance the creation, maintenance, and destruction of the world takes place. O oh, Devi, you are the pinnacle of all auspiciousness. Your order and glories are sitting like a swan on the heads of all the devtas. You are expert in worshipping Krishna, and you are the supreme Vaishnavi. O oh, Parameshwari, O oh, Supreme Goddess, you always engage in the welfare of others. We pay our respects unto you. You perfectly understand the minds of all living entities, so please fulfill our desire to achieve Krishna as our husband. Upon finishing for that day, the gopis paid respects and offered the deity of Katyayani to the Jamuna River. Throughout the days and nights of the entire month of the Vrat, the young girls maintained their unswerving zeal 
their enthusiasm. Their throats always sung about Krishna's qualities. As the days passed, the gopis offered more items and increased the standard of worship. Katyayani Devi was pleased with their pure offerings and regular worship. Thus the gopis hoped to attain her grace. Indeed, just before the end of the month, they received the mercy of Devi. Everyone suspected that the gopis wanted wealth like any ordinary human being, but the gopis did not want any wealth from their worship of Yoga Maya or the Devatas. The all-auspicious Katyayani fulfills desires and bestows mercy and happiness upon those qualified with a pure heart. She reciprocated with the Brajkumaris by appearing within their minds, saying, O oh, auspicious girls, you are the embodiments of Krishna's loving attraction. You will attain all good fortune by worshipping Krishna. The devotees of Lakshmi, who fulfills all desires, do not worship other devatas to attain the favor of Lakshmi Devi. Your sincere prayer ornaments your heart and indicates your own longing for Krishna. Your prayers also make me glorious. Very soon you will attain the association of Krishna according to your individual tastes. Now you can stop your austerities. After speaking thus, Katyayani disappeared from their hearts. The words of the goddess greatly increased the gopis' faith. On the last day of the Vrat, the gopis felt quivering in their left arms, eyes, and thighs. These signs of imminent auspiciousness removed their fatigue and made them confident of attaining the fruit of their desire to enjoy with Krishna. As they considered how best to complete their Vrat, the sun rose brilliantly in the sky. The lotuses responded by opening happily as the atmosphere saturated with immeasurable joy. The gopis worshipped Devi with countless numbers of the best quality articles. And rejoicing over the successful completion of their vrat, the gopis liberally offered the various puja items. Anticipating the forthcoming result of their austerities, the gopis succumbed to a playful mood and stood up excitedly. After receiving the blessings of Katyayani, they took off their fancy pure silk saris, and place them on the clean ground. Following the local customs, the gopis then entered the waters of the Yamuna, clad in nothing but the directions. It is at this moment that the gopis go to bathe, ending their rut. And we have heard what happens next. Krishna arrives upon the scene. And he had previously been traveling with a few friends. And he leaves those friends, understanding the pull within his very own heart that there seem to be gopis nearby. It is at that moment that he steals the clothes of the gopis. And in that way he accepts them as his very own wives. He accepts them within their heart of hearts. And he plays such a trick on them. They try to retrieve their clothes. They try to threaten him. They tell him, we will tell on you. He says, who are you going to tell? And how will you get there? Finally, they have to go and surrender themselves before Govinda and retrieve their clothes. And he accepts them. And they accept him. And then he gives them their clothing back. If we notice, they asked, please let our clothes be exchanged with Krishna's. Krishna already fulfilled that desire by taking them into his possession and then giving them back. His clothes, their clothes became his property and then he gave them back to them. And because those clothes were in the possession of Krishna, undoubtedly they had to have been filled with the fragrance of Krishna's own bodily limbs. They heard the flute of Sri Krishna and then Krishna said, Don't worry. On the full moon night, of Sharada, autumn, and Sharada is a name for the goddess herself also. On the full moon night of Sharada, you and I 
we'll have a complete festival of enjoyment. Where we will gather together under the light of the full moon, which is quite romantic, and we will dance together. On that night fully, you will realize how we have accepted one another with full hearts. This is the worship of the goddess Katyayani that is performed within Sri Vrindavan Dham. And this is the fruit that they received. They said such beautiful prayers. Everything within the arti that was offered to the goddess was somehow, they compared it to their worship of Sri Krishna within their hearts. This is the mood in which we can worship any and everyone. Please help us come closer to Krishna. The goddess is already there. She is his own sister. She is his own potency, his own internal energy. She can do the impossible. That was the words of the gopis. So, O oh goddess Katyayani Devi, you can do the impossible. If you become pleased with us, then you can introduce us to Krishna. You can bring us closer to Krishna. You can help us. O oh, great warrior goddess, savior of the fallen, and protector of devotees, all glory is unto you. Your many hands hold myriads of weapons, and your effulgent face looks beautified by the drops of perspiration that adorn your forehead as you subdue your foes. My heart is riddled with vices and unbreakable habits which keep me entangled in a horrible web of lust, anger, and greed. Just as you destroyed the demon Mahishasur, please destroy those vices within my heart and grant me strength and protection as I forge forward toward the shelter of the lotus feet of my Lord. O Goddess Katyayani, you were so compassionate and so affectionate toward the Brajakumaris. Please protect the tender, sweet plant of devotion that lives within my heart. It often struggles and is barely, barely growing. But I yearn to feed it with devotion, with care, and with the nectar of the pastimes of my Govindadev. O oh Goddess, you can award all protection. You can award faith. You can award bliss. You can award the perfection of life. Please bring us closer to Govinda. Protect our devotional path. Protect our devotional heart. O oh Goddess, all glories unto you. All glories to the goddess known as Katyayani Devi, who is forever our well-wisher and our greatest protector. Thank you so much for being with me. Tomorrow we get very exciting. It's dark and mysterious. And there's a lot to cover. So I'll see you then. In green. I'm looking forward to it already. Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Shishi Radha, Govinda Dev ki jai, Katyayani Devi ki jai, Ambe Mata ki jai, Shri Vrindavindam ki jai, Vaishnav Sangha ki jai. All glories to all of you. Thank you for being here again and again and again. I live for these meetings. So thank you. And until we meet again, I'm wishing you all hearts filled with this mood of the festival, filled with the protection of the Divine Goddess, and filled with love for Sri Krishna himself. Thank you, and I'll see you again soon. Hare Krishna.